Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Welcome. Today we have David Edwards. He's a film director, and we will be learning about his career. But before we begin, um, let's do a little housekeeping. Make sure to check in. It's um, it's a way for your teachers to know that you are are here, you're present here, and not anywhere else. And um, you can also check the great questions document. And more importantly, you have to do the evaluation right after this event. The evaluation is a way for us to give you credit. And if you don't do that, you won't have a credit. And um, th that is a requirement for you to graduate high school. So next is be fully present. Make sure um, you take notes that will help you to do your um, evaluation. And if you have questions, this is a good time to ask and make sure you do it in a chat. And also we figured out that you can turn on your camera because you will not be showing in the video. It's just nice to see that someone's there and not just a black screen, we don't see anybody. So um, uh, David Edwards, you can have the spotlight. You're muted. Thanks for joining. I appreciate your interest. And uh, as Goldie indicated, I want you to feel comfortable um, asking questions as we go. Just to confirm, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So this presentation is split into two parts. Uh, the first part uh, will concern film production and the second part, music production. I'm gonna roughly spend about an hour on each portion. I may spend a little more time on film, mainly because it involves um, a wider variety of uh, potential career paths and um, a, a different set of uh, training opportunities than music production. Um, but I've been involved in both, as you'll soon find out. So just to start, in terms of my background, I have a fairly eclectic background here. I graduated Hillsboro High School back in 1985. I was one of 24 students selected to be part of the undergraduate screenwriting program at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. Yeah, you may be familiar with that film school because a number of uh, famous directors graduated from the program, uh, most probably most notably uh, George Lucas, but a number of other directors also graduated from the program, Francis Ford Coppola, uh, John Milius, and a number of others. I was um, in film school for the first two years I was at USC. Um, I ultimately decided it was too much like a trade school uh, for my comfort. Um, Basically, I, I took every class with the same 23 other people. And my program was focused almost entirely on film. Uh, we were allowed only one elective uh, each year for a total of four electives. Uh, we were required to take an art history course as part of the first year of our training. But outside of that, every um, class we took involved film. and. Ultimately, I decided that um, it seemed like a, a, a limited uh, way for me to develop as a writer. Uh, and I, I got into film primarily uh, from the writing side of things. Uh, so I ended up transferring to the English department at USC and ultimately I was enrolled in a double doctorate program at USC that was split between English literature and film. 
Um, in any event, um, while I was in film school, I worked on a number of uh, student projects. Uh, my work study included a stint in the cinema stock room. That meant I worked in the um, uh, production office at the school, uh, helping students um, get their equipment for their weekday and more importantly, their weekend uh, shoots. So I loaded up carts of, uh, you know, C stands and lights of various kinds. At this time, prior to the uh, advent of high-end digital uh, production, we did do some quarter inch videotape, but most students shot on film. In fact, uh, my first highly intense uh, film production course involved shooting uh, five um, Super 8 films in a 15 week semester, which means I had to uh, produce a film every three weeks uh, for that course. Uh, that was the most intense kind of film course I took in college outside of working on actual Hollywood productions. Um, while I was going to school, I did some work in, for a variety of um, Hollywood studios. Um, I worked in what they call the uh, Creative Affairs Department. Uh, that's the department that's tasked with identifying new projects. Uh, I read and critiqued uh, unproduced screenplays uh, with the notion that would help companies identify uh, potential films for production. Um, I did that work first for the DeLorentes Entertainment Group. Uh, they went bankrupt during the period I worked for them. And then I switched to Roger Corman's company. You might know him as a low budget film impresario. Um, he's worked under a number of different company names. I think he's currently working under uh, the Concord Film Productions uh, banner now. In any event, I worked for him and then I ended up working for the producer of the film Platoon uh, shortly after it won Best Picture. And I read screenplays for that. Um, for his next production, I actually identified the screenplay that ultimately turned into a movie with uh, Willem Dafoe called Triumph of the uh, Spirit. It was a World War II uh, boxing picture. Um, and I worked with the screenwriter on a number of rewrites to restructure the picture. Um, he is uh, Eastern European. And so his uh, understanding of English uh, was somewhat uh, limited. So I worked with him on rewriting the screenplay. And then I actually moved to a different company when my boss was fired. You know, that'll be a common refrain here because in Hollywood, uh, your tenure in any one position uh, seems to be fairly limited once you get into the upper echelons of uh, film production. As it happens, and I'll digress just <laughs> briefly here, my boss at the time, who was VP of uh, Creative Affairs under Arnold Copelson's company, knew she was going to be fired and she offered me her job. Um, it was a very strange meeting. I had come in actually talking about, you know, to talk to her about one of my own screenplays, which they were interested in producing um, as a vehicle for Eddie Murphy. Didn't seem to me to be an appropriate vehicle for him, but. What, who was I to say? I was a sophomore in college. Many of them, uh, she knew she was going to be fired. She offered me her job and I had to remind her that I was only a sophomore in college. And I understood that, you know, someone in her position was likely to last two years or less before they had to move on. So I told her I wanted to get a degree. And so after she left the company, I continued to work for her replacement for a while. And then I moved to working for a Beverly Hills talent agency also in creative affairs, they basically managed a, a lot of writers. Uh, they had started their company after uh, working out uh, the legal arrangements for Ridley Scott to direct the film Legend. Um, it's a 
high-end uh, fantasy film starring Tom Cruise. In any event, I worked for them uh, for another like three or four years. Um, I ended up writing a treatment for them that became a miniseries on Stalin starring uh, Robert De Niro. Um, and then I wrote some other screenplays uh, for them, all of which went unproduced. Uh, they tried to connect me with Jack Kirby. You might know him as uh, one of the stalwart uh, Marvel Comics artists who co-created uh, the Avengers <laughs> and uh, most of uh, Marvel's um, longstanding comic book characters with the exception of Spider-Man. Um, he was working in animation and uh, my agents kind of liked his creativity, but knew that he was uh, had some issues with writing dialogue. Um, and that happened to be one of my specialties. So they tried to connect us, but his wife was, um, I guess, uh, wary of pairing him with anybody uh, thinking that uh, because of the way he was treated at Marvel Comics, he was very uh, bitter about any kind of corporate influence or the potential influence of anybody else who could take credit for his work. Um, so basically, he uh, rejected any notion of a partnership. Um, but ultimately, it, that, and, uh, it would have been, I think, a, a good partnership in that sense, but we'll see. Uh, <laughs> um, so then I ended up um, I ended up getting a master's degree in English literature from USC, and then I got a second master's degree in public affairs from the University of Oregon, and I ended up uh, getting a day job in um, market research. So I do commercial market research for a living. I've been doing it now for about thirty years. I worked for I worked for mainly uh, Fortune five hundred companies, uh, helping them develop new products and refine their marketing techniques. So I do both qualitative work, that is one-on-one -on -one, like one -on -one interviews or focus groups, um, as well as um, um, online and telephone surveys, uh, mainly for uh, product demand and, uh, and, um, and refinement work. So I, I've worked with, you know, a wide variety of, of companies. I focused on um, telecommunications and IT work for a long time. And Nintendo was one of my clients for about 10 years uh, when I had my own market research firm. And we were the only like North American research firm that did hands-on research on the Wii console before it was released. Um, I also ended up serving in the Oregon House of Representatives for a couple of terms. And then when my wife took ill, I actually sold my ownership stake in my market research firm and I quit the legislature and I took a year and a half off from working on a day to day basis. And during that period, I wrote, directed and produced my first feature film called Nightscape. And I ended up creating kind of a transmedia series around it. Uh, the sixth novel in the Nightscape series will be out uh, later this week. It is the first in a cycle of fantasy novels set in a, on a post-apocalyptic earth. Um, and it ties into the second film that I'm currently working on, which is in uh, post-production. So I've uh, talked for a bit without um, any questions. Does anybody have any questions at this point before I get into the uh, gist of my presentation on film? Okay. I'm going to start with just uh, kind of going through the types of um, the, the types of positions that are available to folks in this field, start going through basically the types of positions associated with different stages of production. For both film and music production, there are basically three stages. You have pre-production, 
And then in film, you have principal photography or production, and then you have post-production. So some of the key positions in the pre-production stage are the writer, uh, producer, director, usually the first assistant director, um, production coordinator, and some other folks are also involved at that stage. Basically, this is the stage in production in which you are gearing up for principal photography. So anybody who has a role, uh, typically mainly department heads at this point, um, are involved in all of the planning uh, for principal photography. I worked most closely with my cinematographer in terms of establishing kind of a, a sense of style um, and doing storyboards. I did some storyboards by hand um, and some storyboards using some online tools, which proved more or less effective. Um, and then I worked with um, a, the head of wardrobe on costuming, but because this was a low budget uh, production in both cases that were basically self-funded, um, I did a lot of jobs myself. So I served as my own kind of production designer. I hired individual artists to do concept work uh, basically, usually based on a sketch or two that I had done myself. Um, and then I did most of the costuming for the most recent picture, uh, literally where I would design the costume. I had a concept artist draw it up in detail and then I ordered all of the costume pieces and the head of wardrobe um, just worked on, um, you know, uh, fitting the pieces to the actors. I did uh, in my most recent production, uh, recruit my cast early in the production. Um, it's a science fantasy film that requires a lot of uh, medieval style combat. So I put myself in the film for budgetary reasons, primarily. Um, the dialogue is like a secondhand Shakespeare, and I had a hard time, uh, you know, finding someone who could handle the physical aspects of the role. Um, given that the character that I play is supposed to be middle aged, so as it happens, the character I did wasn't intending to play the part, but the character is about my age, so I went ahead and did that because I was able to commit. Uh, to all of the sword fight training. So I was in combat training for almost 10 months before we shot the picture. Um, and that was to ensure that all of the sword fights, and there were four of them in the film, um, were uh, realistic. Um, and, and we could, and we could um, do them, shoot them quickly because we knew the routines um, and such. The lead actress uh, who grew up in Beaverton uh, for the most part, um, and, but lives in Los Angeles now, trained under uh, a famous stunt coordinator, Anthony DeLongas. He trained Harrison Ford on how to use a whip during for the Indiana Jones movies and also worked with Michelle Pfeiffer on Batman Returns. He himself is an actor, uh, voiceover artist and stunt coordinator. Um, He's worked on a number of sword and sorcery pictures. And so he was really helpful. And then I had a separate stunt coordinator up here. Um, in fact, two of them uh, that we used to choreograph all of the action sequences. But in any event, I had to involve all the actors up front. Typically in pre-production, you wouldn't go to that length in involving all the actors. Um, sometimes you can pick them just a few weeks before you start shooting. Um, but in this case, it was necessary to get everybody on board up front. Um, it also gave us time to kind of work through uh, some costuming uh, issues because we had to make sure the costumes could stand up to combat conditions. Other positions um, that are typically involved in pre-production involve location management, the head grip, who's the person who's responsible for basically helping the gaffer, the person who is the chief lighting technician, 
like move all the equipment around. They're also responsible for like camera mounts and things like that. On my first picture, we had a lot of car stunts and we did some, uh, we had to mount the cameras on the car. Um, as you might imagine, that was a rather risky proposition. Uh, the camera that we used at the time was a high-end, well, what was then state-of-the-art uh, 4K uh, digital camera. It cost around $60,000, and we had to mount them on cars that were going up to 80 miles an hour uh, in some cases. And so clearly we didn't want the camera to fall off the mount at any point. So that job was really critical. That's not only getting the shots we needed, but also making sure that I didn't have to take advantage of the insurance I'd taken out in, uh, in pre-production. Uh, there are also a number of other uh, positions you, you are typically involved, storyboard artists, um, kind of special effects uh, folks are typically involved up front. Um, in part for budgeting purposes, uh, I did my own budgeting by department. And basically what you have to do is you have to have your script developed well enough so that you can, you know, describe in detail what exactly is going to be required of people in different positions so that they can give you a reasonable estimate of how long it's going to take them and what the resources required might be. For instance, on my latest picture, um, the makeup artist uh, who had worked on a lot of big Hollywood pictures and recently moved to Oregon permanently. She's worked on like the amazing Spider-Man and a number of other big budget pictures. She did my makeup for me. I worked with her early on in developing a lot of the prosthetics. We had characters, including mine, that had like permanent scars that they had to apply every day. Um, and so we worked out a lot of all of the makeup effects up front in terms of how we were gonna do them. Um, so that she could give me a, a reasonable uh, idea of the budget. So any questions about, I just kind of give you a brief overview of some of the positions. Any kind of questions at this point? What is the, like the first, like when someone goes in without any background, what would be their position? So there were a number of um, students who actually worked on my latest picture, and they came in as largely as production assistants. That's kind of a catch all term. Um, some of them uh, worked with the caterer to help kind of set all that stuff up, but then they were available then to be on set to uh, work on a variety of tasks. Uh, we had on, the, on my latest picture, we had a couple of Wi-Fi controlled robots. And I enlisted some of the PAs to actually work the robots. Um, so we had, they used an iPad control uh, for the robots. And so some of their work is in the picture. In other cases, they were helping like the grip department move um, props around. We had a, a, a number of large props, including an eight foot high severed robot head and a uh, kind of alien spider corpse <laughs> that was 10 feet in diameter and uh, required a number of people to move. Some of them did some set dressing and some other things. So uh, they got exposure to a lot of different departments. They were able to like hang out with the cinematographer and people doing focus pulling and that sort of thing to get a sense of what people were doing. And we have some um, questions in the chat. How many of those jobs have you done? Um, I've done most of them uh, myself. Uh, growing up, I at the time, Hillsborough High School had a radio TV program. It was a two period course restricted solely to juniors and seniors. And I got a lot of video production experience. And then I made a number of community access uh, television uh, programs on my own uh, using some of that equipment. Um, and then I started shooting in Super 8. Uh, so I, I've done a number of, of different things. And fortunately, I'm able to draw. So I do a lot of, I did my own storyboards 
So the storyboard artist, uh, I see, is one of the questions. And uh, basically, the storyboard artist is responsible for translating the script into a comic book style uh, series of drawings. And the director isn't obligated to kind of follow their uh, recommended or suggested camera angles and such, but it is helpful in production. Um, typically, the director works fairly closely with the storyboard artist to come up with representative art so that other members of the production uh, have a good sense of what the, the film is ultimately going to look like. Do you travel a lot on during production? Uh, it depends on kind of the scale at which you're working. So if you're working for a larger studio, it's likely that you will be uh, uh, traveling quite a bit. Um, but it didn't, again, it just depends on the, the script and the nature of the, uh, of the picture. On my first picture, we, I made the, I think, I made the foolish mistake of, of writing a script that required 27 different locations and we shot it in 21 days. So you can do the math that we basically moved around almost every day of production. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing that again, if you're interested in doing uh, independent film. However, uh, if you're working on, you know, big budget Hollywood productions, a lot of them do a lot of on location shooting and they, and their principal photography, um, you know, usually extends uh, anywhere from like three to like, could be 12 months, uh, depending on, on, uh, on the nature of the picture. Okay. Uh, someone asked, you know, how the gaffer comes into play and in, during pre-production and basically that person uh, comes into play as we're designing kind of the look and feel of the film. Uh, for my first picture, I actually worked with my cinematographer. We chose a film to serve as a model kind of film in terms of the types of camera work that we would use and also the color palette. And because the gaffer is responsible for lighting, it's important to get, a, to get them involved to understand how they want to approach the lighting in different scenes to maintain consistency from day and night um, and across the picture. And then what we envision in terms of uh, the potential kind of color template, you can change a lot now with digital um, after the fact. And in fact, uh, with my current picture, we shot the whole thing on in a studio, a green screen studio that I set up in Hillsborough. And so all of the backgrounds will be composited in later. Um, and we will just do all the color correction um as we do that and so the look of the film ultimately will will be very different from the way it looked when we first shot it so or the raw footage okay i'm going to move on to some so here's some of the pre-production art on the right that um that i developed that i commissioned for the film this is for there are some like cartoon animation scenes and uh, in my current picture, as well as some stop motion, uh, live action puppetry, and some Jurassic Park uh, kind of 3D creature effects. <laughs> so it's a quite ambitious production. So you see that the teaser poster on the left and the some of the pre-production art on the right. Um, and here are some other pre-production art. And again, I would typically like do the sketches, initial sketches, and then turn them over to a concept artist uh, for development. So, um, and this is actually a creature that is developed into developed into a 3D model. So you can see like the creature, it sends out these uh, kind of electrified bubbles. Um, so you can see the art on the far left and then the 3D model that the uh, special effects company started to develop. Um, and we've done some motion tests with this uh, creature, but they really needed to wait for me to shoot plates in the studio before they could move any farther. So now they're starting to work on some of the scenes involving this creature. Um, so it's pretty exciting to see that come to life. 
And here's some combat scenes. I'm actually on the left, um, and one of my actresses is on the right. Uh, so this is what it looks like in kind of behind the scenes. It's got a raw uh, photo. Uh, we're fighting on what will look like an asteroid, um, and it's actually snowing in some cases. The background will be like a big starscape. Um, and her weapon will be electrified. Um, it's modeled after an ancient uh, Aztec weapon. Um, and then when you get to production, there are a number of other uh, folks involved. Um, you know, art department, camera, lighting and grip. Uh, there are a wide variety of positions. I'm just gonna point out a few that you might not be aware of, but are nonetheless critical to any production. One of them is the script supervisor. So I was fortunate to have the same script supervisor on both my films. Um, that is the person who um, keeps track of all of the shots. Um, some of that information is captured on the slate uh, at the beginning of each take. However, the script supervisor takes much more detailed notes, uh, sometimes to the level of identifying like how far the camera is from the subject um, in the event that we need to take a plate for effects purposes or, um, or we need to replicate the shot later on from a different angle, uh, those sorts of things. She also um, is responsible, simply a she, but to be a he, uh, that person is typically responsible for um, also taking pictures at the beginning of each, uh, not usually beginning of each take, but as we start a new scene uh, to make sure that the props and costumes and so on maintain some level of continuity as you shoot. Um, because one of the dangers is that, you know, as you do multiple takes, the actors move props around. And so the beginning of the shots have props in different locations and that sort of thing. And that's always problematic. So for continuity purposes, this person is really important. And typically the director will tell the script supervisor which of the number of takes you might do for any particular scene, uh, which one the director prefers. Um, and that is usually a note that goes to the, then all of the script supervisor's notes go to the editing room so that the editor can take a look at those as they're putting together the kind of the first uh, draft edit of the of the film. Um, let's see. Other than that, I think most everything's fairly um, self-explanatory, with the exception of maybe some of the folks in the lighting and grip department. Um, you do typically need an electrician on set. So like for my latest uh, production, um, I had to uh, have the warehouse upgraded electrically before we could even shoot in order to handle all of the lighting equipment. Um, and my on-set electrician actually did some patchwork so that we could redistribute the cords because we had a whole lighting rig set up above the stage. And then we had separate lights uh, on the side on C stands and whatnot. So it was pretty complicated from a lighting standpoint. And that required then um, a lot more kind of electrical knowledge than would be typical, I think, on a, on a production of that sort. And here are a few of the props from the film to get a sense of the scale. So I. I did some uh, sketch and then I had a concept artist come up with a more detailed kind of version of the severed robot head that we featured in uh, a few scenes. And then I had a, a company in Utah actually uh, carve this. I thought it was going to be a 3D um, sculpt. Instead, they actually had one of their artists hand sculpted from the art. Um, and then I painted it to make it look like metal. <laughs> uh, it took about, let's see, two months for them to sculpt. And it took me another two months to paint, mainly because I used this really bizarre painting technique to um, give it the 
kind of the modeled uh, rust look. Um, and it was very time consuming. I could only do one section, very small section of the prop at a time. Um, Uh, in terms of costumes, in the for the most recent production, uh, most of the costumes are sort of off the shelf in a sense, um, in that I bought various pieces and then the head of the wardrobe department uh, made adjustments to them. I think all told, it probably took a couple of months for all of the costumes. They're all medieval style, uh, which became problematic in, because we shot in August, uh, where we had some of those like hottest days on record. Um, and I was wearing probably 40 pounds of leather. Um, so because I, I wore like four layers, effectively, uh, some for safety and some just for the look. So here are a few other uh, key positions. Yeah, makeup and wardrobe. Um, we had one main uh, makeup artist and then a number of key makeup artists that came in on a daily basis. Um, and all of these folks are local. I shot uh, my recent picture, actually both pictures in and around Hillsboro. Um, the uh, sound mixer is someone on set. They have a little cart uh, with a recorder and they usually have a boom mic. Sometimes the boom is operated by a different person. Um, because of the sound issues uh, associated with the location of the warehouse where we shot uh, my most recent picture, we shot at night. So we had to adopt everyone, cast and crew had to adopt a night shoot schedule, which meant that I was typically at the studio from 6 p.m. until 6 a.m. Uh, I slept about four, four and a half hours a day for just about five weeks. I wouldn't recommend doing that either. <laughs> um, I think most everybody got used to it after a while, but um, my wife also served as the caterer and we ate dinner at eight o'clock in the evening and at 1230 in the morning. And then I typically ate again when I got home about 630 in the morning. Um, so it was very weird and I had a hard time like readjusting to my regular schedule. I actually stayed up for 40 hours on the last day of shooting, hoping that by pushing myself to stay up and go to work, basically right after we finished, I just went home, took a shower on the last day of shooting and then went to my day job in Vancouver. Um, I was hoping that I would, it would push me into a regular daytime schedule again, but that that really didn't work. <laughs> uh, and then in post-production, so this is where I am with my current picture. Uh, we're in post, uh, basically uh, in the early editing stages. I'm also working on one sequence we didn't shoot during principal photography because it's a stop motion sequence involving uh, a heavily articulated puppet. So, um, the puppet construction is in progress. I expect that we'll have the puppet ready by the end of the month. And then someone from Leica who's working on their most, uh, their current picture um, is scheduled to do the stop motion after that. So I'll be working with her on, uh, on that probably in December. And it's likely to take us probably three months or so just to shoot a three minute sequence. So the editor is uh, is really critical during post, as well as there's typically a color correction supervisor or artist, although I intend to do that myself this time. I do have a sound designer. Um, he's a fantastic sound designer, worked on all nine seasons of Grimm. Uh, he worked on my first picture. He's also a musician and has his own sound studio. So, um, he, I've had a number of discussions with him about potential sound design ideas. Um, and he's actually friends with the composer on the picture. Um, and I'll also be using the same composer I used on the first picture as well. 
Um, he's in high demand, so I'm lucky I got him because he does a lot of um, music production as well. And he does incidental music for a number of like Disney cartoon shows on the Disney XD channel. And then typically there are other folks in marketing um, and all of that, which I typically don't have to worry about too much, although I do some of my own marketing. So um, in terms of education, here's what I would encourage you to do. Uh, given that you're in high school, um, I would encourage you to just start making short films because the more mistakes you make at this stage when no one's really paying attention, the better. <laughs> the easier it will be for you later on and the more proficient you'll get um, as you go. Um, and so what I would what I would recommend there, I think a, there are a number of different opportunities. Um, you can volunteer as a production assistant on, um, on local productions. Um, sometimes it may be difficult to discover like who's doing what. There is a, uh, like a, a producer association um, in Portland um, that you can try to connect with. There's also the Oregon uh, the state of Oregon's uh, film and video office that keeps track of all the productions in, uh, in the state. And you can try to find out you know, who's doing what and maybe connect with them and volunteer. Um, as I said, as I mentioned earlier, um, when I was in high school, I did uh, community access television uh, programming. Um, basically, you can go out and get training from the community access television uh, station personnel. And then you're allowed to check out the equipment for no charge um, and shoot your productions. The only requirement is that whatever you produce has to appear on community access television. And then you can, as I said, you can just kind of go off on your own and start experimenting with different uh, filmic techniques. Um, you can use an iPhone or an iPad or um, anything that records at a reasonable uh, with, with a reasonable quality, and uh, there are a number of kind of uh, free or inexpensive um, editing programs. You don't have to go to the extent of getting, you know, Final Cut Pro or using Adobe Premiere. Um, I'm using the latter on my production, but uh, that's only because I need something that's tied into the special effects program that we're using. Uh, we're using primarily After Effects. Um, so in any event, unless you want to go into kind of the effects trade um, or want to do some really fancy editing um, with a lot of like trick music video style edits, um, you can use a number of kind of free or relatively inexpensive programs. In terms of what, um, what's available after high school, so there are a number of different pathways um, and you just have to figure out which one is, is right for you depending on your um, interests. Um, there, is, there are a number of trade schools and you can just get certification. I think full sale is probably the most prominent one, but there are a number um, of local um, certification programs here in here in Portland. Um, there are kind of two-year community college certification programs. You can go to a four-year college with a focus on film production, which is what I did, although I focused on the screenwriting program um, as opposed to production. I will say that if you have an interest in doing that, you really need a um, an outstanding portfolio. They will ask for a reel, uh, basically a demo reel to um, so they can get a sense of your uh, approach uh, to film. Um, USC still has the screenwriting program. And if you apply to that, they will ask for basically synopses uh, for a number of potential films, again, to get a sense of um, you know, it, ideas that you might have 
uh, that might be uh, might be workable uh, for for fe potential features you could work on later in, in your um, college career. Um, yeah, in terms of you know the four year colleges, um, while it's possible now with the advent of digital technology to shoot films independently outside of Los Angeles and New York. If you really want to work on big budget productions, or even if you really want big budget financing for your independent production, I would still recommend going to one of those two locales. So in Los Angeles, the most prominent schools for film are USC um, and to a lesser extent UCLA. Um, USC has the largest production facility and largest production facilities um, in the area, but there are a number of other schools that have them, including UCLA. Um, and it's, it's more important in some ways just to be in Los Angeles and get exposure to the larger industry as opposed to what school you're, you're attending um, because it's all about making connections with people. It's still a heavily um, network, uh, driven uh, industry, um, so I would um, so I would encourage you to, uh, if you're interested in working on big budget productions, to to think about Los Angeles or New York. In New York, the four year college I'd recommend would be the NYU Film School, which is the most famous one. I will say there is a school outside of Chicago, which I think is really interesting. I know a couple of graduates from the program and I interviewed one of the professors there. It's called uh, uh, Columbia, not the Columbia uh, University in New York, but it's, uh, it's outside of Chicago and they offer a combination of a sort of a liberal arts degree with a focus on film. And I like that combination. I do think that it's important for you to have an understanding of something outside of film um, especially if you want to be a writer, director, or even a producer. So you have some sense of kind of what perspective you might want to take um, on, on the any, any kind of filmic topics you, you might want to tackle. And then you can go to a four-year college in a non-film field and potentially go to graduate school um, in film. Or you could just simply go to a four-year college in a non-film field in an area that has a lot of production going on. Again, Los Angeles or New York, or maybe Chicago, um, and and simply you know spend your free time uh, working on film production. You know, apprenticing yourself to somebody in a trade uh, like the cinematographer, or maybe the um, maybe in the in the art department or wardrobe. Um, so that's certainly a, uh, a reasonable path as well. And then there are a number of graduate programs, basically master's program, two-year programs that are just uh, heavily, in, um, uh, that, that present a lot of uh, uh, production techniques. So the AFI program is probably the most famous. They have chapters all over the place, but um, it would be beneficial again to do the AFI program in like a Los Angeles or New York Again, because you make a lot of contacts there um, while you're going to school. Um, and in that type of production, that type of program, you're required to basically serve on like on a film production uh, for somebody's master's thesis. And, uh, and everyone, you get exposure to every position up until that point. And then a handful of students are chosen uh, to, to direct a, a project at the end. So I see we have a few questions. What do we do? For, what do we do for underwater filming? Uh, I haven't done any underwater filming. Uh, there are special cameras for that purpose, however, um, but I haven't done any personally. Um, and my inspirations, boy, I have some favorite directors, um, mainly Martin Scorsese, um, 
Stanley Kubrick, and boy, Vim Vendors. Hello, David. Actually directed um, my most uh, my favorite film, which is called Wings of Desire, uh, which is a an international picture in the sense that it's both in German and English. Uh, what made me go into this profession? Um, well, I started out as an artist. I could draw. And so I um, was very interested in the visual arts. And I thought at first I might be a comic book artist. And then I started kind of writing and basically drawing my own storyboards. And then that kind of led me into screenwriting. Um, it was just a way for me to kind of express myself in a visual way that was consistent with my initial attraction to, uh, to art. Um, an average day on the job. So while we're in production, um, I served as kind of writer, director, producer. So my average day, as I said, was largely a 12 to 14 hour work day. Um, in which I would prep for each day of shooting. I had written out like a shot list for each day that I'd worked out with my cinematographer. And then I would go to the set. I would work with the cinematographer to um, uh, figure out what the sequence should be for shooting each of the shots. We would typically work from the widest shots to the closest shots. Um, on my latest picture, because we shot everything in a studio, we had set up uh, what's called dolly track, which we could put the camera on a little like a little hand cart or a train track. <laughs> so you get smooth camera movement. Um, and that was typically the kind of the widest kind of shot we would get. And then we would gradually move in to the camera on, um, on a regular camera stand or sticks, what we call them. Um, sometimes we do unusual shots where you might shoot from the top of a ladder. We want to get like an extreme um, high angled shot, those sorts of things. We work all the sequence of all that out first. And then because I was also in the film, I had to go then to wardrobe and makeup. Um, uh, and while they were setting up all the lights and camera work, and then I would go on to set and then we would, I would act, and then I would review uh, select takes on the video monitor just to make sure I'd, we got footage that I thought we could edit. Um, and so as a director, you have to kind of keep in mind um, how you're going to edit all the shots together. So all that has to be kind of kept in your head in a way. Um, especially on a fast moving low budget production. Um, we had 25 days of shooting uh, for my latest picture. So four more days than my first one. Um, and we didn't have to move locations. So we captured a lot more footage. So I have over 100, 100 hours of footage uh, for a film that will probably be under two hours. So I've got a lot of footage. Um, and fortunately, um, the actors were well rehearsed, uh, both in terms of the physical combat pieces and also the dialogue. So for instance, there was one night where the lead actress and I had a scene together that we could do from beginning to end. It ran for seven and a half minutes. And we just did it, we did it 30 times uh, from various angles. Um, and with kind of various uh, adjustments to um, the acting style and such. So let's see, a few other questions here. Um, yeah, so in terms of how long it takes to shoot an average movie, um, it, uh, it really depends on uh, the picture and what your budget allows. So every day 
uh, on my movie was around $4,000. So it was important that we kept to our schedule. So we always had to get in a certain number of shots or we had to finish a certain number of scenes each day. Typically you look at it from the standpoint of how many script pages you need to shoot each day. Um, and I, we tended to shoot around three to four pages a day, which is fairly aggressive. Um, the script was actually much longer than our shooting schedule would suggest because as I said, there are some sequences that are um, like cartoon animation and those comprised um, a number of scenes. And then there were some other scenes that were um, that are stop motion and other or in other scenes that are effects. So that is that are just outside principal photography altogether. Um, so we spent 25 days shooting roughly 82 pages of script. Um, so yes, we do have deadlines for the current picture and there are really no deadlines in terms of finishing the picture, although I would like to finish it by 2023. I think it's gonna take about two years to finish mainly because um, of the number of special effects shots that are required. We shot everything against a green screen. So virtually every shot has an effect of some kind or another. Uh, what do I wish I would have known about my job before doing it? Well, um, I think it really depends on what you want to try to accomplish. A lot of people want to be writer directors. However, those folks, um, unless you're kind of a top tier writer director, um, have a diff have difficulty kind of getting work consistently. Um, I would actually, if knowing kind of how the industry actually works now, I would have probably pursued more of a trade in one of the departments, maybe art department doing concept design work because you're almost guaranteed to get a lot of work because there are a lot, there's a lot more demand for that as opposed to being a writer director. Only one person can do that job. On a typical film, there are multiple uh, concept artists and oftentimes you're working on a picture for a year or two, depending on uh, the nature of the picture. So in terms of getting experience, um, again, I would, I would encourage you to do what you can while you're still in school, uh, volunteering, um, again, making your own pictures. So whether that means getting trained on and, and effectively borrowing equipment from the community access station, which is in Beaverton, uh, as part of a magnet school there, um, or just, you know, shooting a, a movie on an iPhone or an iPad. Uh, whatever you can do now to kind of get a sense of how film works uh, before you start presenting yourself to bigger productions is always helpful. Um, I had someone who was interested in breaking into the industry um, hang out on the set of my latest picture, and he was putting together his own kind of behind the scenes, uh, docu sort of kind of pseudo documentary. And that was gonna be his kind of calling card, so to speak, in presenting himself to other productions. So any other questions? Is there any instance where you already done the pre-production and almost done with the post-production and then the movie just like, not going any forward uh that does happen so it's not always guaranteed that you get distribution um with my first picture um i got worldwide distribution after my first uh festival screening so i i, 
I took a, the festival route and we had a screening at, uh, it was actually the inaugural uh, kind of film uh, screening at the Montreal um, Film Festival. It was, it had traditionally been just a comic book convention in Montreal and they added film that first, uh, that year. And um, a distributor rep was in the audience and saw the picture and we cut a deal about three days after I showed it the first time. The picture still uh, was still screened at a, at a couple of other festivals. And then once the picture was picked up for distribution, um, I just had to package it, um, which meant in some cases, just reformatting it in a way that they wanted for uh, high definition uh, video uh, distribution, and um, and then they just they launched it about a year later. They had a number of other films on their in their portfolio they had to release first, um, and that went fairly well. Unfortunately, my first picture was pirated on YouTube. And I, at the time, you basically had to continually send cease and desist orders, which became really time consuming. Um, and basically it was just, it was too late that basically I had over a million illegal downloads on YouTube. So <laughs> I didn't make any money on my first picture, I think for that reason, although it was on, um, you know, Netflix and Amazon Prime and uh, Xbox, and Sony PlayStation platforms and on a, in a number of other, um, uh, in a, on, a, on a number of other platforms as well. But, um, but yes, there are, there are cases where pictures are finished and then uh, don't find distribution. Uh, nowadays, uh, that's rare, that's fairly rare uh, because there are so many streaming outlets and folks can always self-distribute online. Um, oh, yes. So for borrowing equipment in Beaverton, the community access station, it's a, it's attached to a magnet school. I forget the name offhand, but you can look it up. Uh, but it's just community access television. They have a studio at a magnet school in Beaverton. Um, the most and least rewarding aspect of the industry. Well, it depends. If you're an independent doing your own productions, the most rewarding thing is that you don't have a producer over your shoulder uh, making decisions for you. Um, after this presentation, in fact, I'm, I'm interviewing the producer for a film you may be aware of called The Beast Master, which was a sword and sorcery film from the 1980s. And the director wrote a memoir vilifying the producer that I'm about to interview uh, for his level of interference in the film. You don't have that level of interference or any interference whatsoever if you're, own, you're, you're working independently as your own kind of writer, director, or producer. The downside of that is, of course, financing, where you basically have to self-finance or find uh, a group of investors who are willing to take a chance on an independent production. Uh, filmmaking is, uh, is a risky proposition. Um, so it's uh, sort of that 80-20 rule, about 20% of the films make about 80% of the revenue for any given year. And um, given the current state of the distribution market, um, it's very challenging for independent films to uh, to succeed. It used to be when I was for, in film school that you could pre-sell a picture to foreign territories and basically work up your production uh, budget that way. And basically, you could, if you budgeted properly, you could actually make money on your picture before you even released it. Um, and you really can't do that anymore. Um, nowadays, you know, you basically have to make a picture and then seek a distributor after the after the fact, um, unless you're connected again with a um, with a with a um, an established studio. So I'm actually going to go to the American Film Market next fall. It's an annual, uh, it's a biannual meeting. Uh, there's one in Los Angeles, 
every year in the fall. And it's basically just a place where people who have independent films can meet up with potential distributors and make a pitch. Um, so I intend to do that uh, next year. Hopefully I'll have a trailer of the film by then to pitch along with uh, maybe some completed uh, scenes to show. Um, but failing that, uh, I'm considering just self-distributing the film, starting with theaters and doing uh, exclusive kind of art house uh, showings of the film, and then eventually going to video on demand. So we'll see. Yeah. Yeah, there was a question about, I am an independent filmmaker. Um, I have worked for studios in the past, uh, but I, I don't have any association with the studio at present. Any other questions? Okay. I will move on to music production. Um, and this is a sort of simpler in the sense that there are kind of fewer positions involved. Um, and the process is a uh, kind of simpler in the sense that um, while there are the same basic stages um, as in film production, um, they tend to be less complicated. Um, So I'm gonna start with uh, some, again, with some key positions for music production. Uh, the photo, by the way, is of a, uh, of a singer who worked on uh, my band's first album. So I have a, a, a progressive rock band. We've done one album. Uh, we're actually in the process. We're about half finished with our second album. My songwriting partner is uh, Tony Gaglio, uh, who attended Hillsborough High School with me. In fact, we've known each other since we were 12 years old. <laughs> we met in the sixth grade at Reedville Elementary. Um, and he is a renowned guitarist. Um, he's been nominated for a Grammy. He was recognized by Guitar World Magazine as one of the top 10 unsigned guitarists in the country. Um, and he has a music store in Beaverton and does music production um, and works as a session musician uh, for various bands um, on the side. So in terms of key positions, you have the composer, uh, which in my case is uh, myself working with uh, my songwriting partner. I, um, I was trained on guitar and piano, although I don't play either anymore. Um, and I know just enough basically to be dangerous. So Tony writes most of the music per se. And then I work with him on arranging the music. Um, and I write all the lyrics and I usually work on the vocal melodies uh, with the singers. On our first album, we had three lead singers plus some backup vocalists. And on the newest one, we will also have three lead singers and some backup vocalists, including an operatic soprano and a church choir. So the, the production of our albums is rather ambitious, involving a wide variety of instruments. Uh, other positions include, of course, musicians, a producer, uh, recording engineer, engineer, the mastering engineer. So the recording engineer is the person who sits in the studio with you and helps with the uh, recording. And then that person may or may not also uh, work on the final mix of the album. Uh, we use a recording engineer in Portland at a studio called The Map Room, and re we record some of our music there and some at uh, Tony's Music Store. This depends on uh, what it is we're recording. Uh, all of the vocals and some of the more complicated mic setups uh, we record at The Map Room, which is in Northeast Portland. Um, so like drums are hard to mic. Um, there is like a grand piano there, um, which we have used and which would require then us using the studio. Um, and then all the vocals, as I said, are recorded there. For the new album, we're also integrating harp on one song and 
we'll record that there. And then we've recorded strings on the first album and we'll do that again on the second. Uh, we did that live and the person who uh, wrote the strings uh, sections played uh, violin and then her partner played uh, stand up bass. So uh, we'll record those instruments also in the studio uh, in Portland as opposed to Tony's store. So the recording engineer is responsible for kind of miking all those uh, recording sessions and then handling the recording itself. Um, and then the mastering engineer is a separate job. And um, typically that person does the final uh, EQing of the record. That is, they set the final um, kind of sound levels. Um, and I used someone in Portland uh, to do that on the first record. I don't know who I'll have master it this time around. Um, I was pretty happy with it the first time, but it took, I think, four tries before uh, Tony and I were really satisfied with the way it was mastered. Um, the initial mastering was really uh, loud, like, <laughs> like just the preset uh, loudness was way too, um, way too high. And so we had to tone it down. Um, and eventually we, we got to a, a happy, happy medium. Um, and then there's the album artist or designer, uh, sometimes legal counsel, uh, especially if you're doing uh, a record that involves sampling other uh, or quoting uh, other music. Um, and then there are marketing folks involved, uh, marketing director, publicist, uh, distribution coordinator, that sort of thing. Um, we do our own distribution, and I haven't used a marketing director since I, I tend to do my own, my own marketing as well. Um, but um, um, some of those may come into play if you're working with a, a small label. Okay, I'll kind of take you through production a little bit. So pre-production, Tony and I spend all of our time just kind of working up uh, the concept for the album. Uh, our first album is a concept album that even has uh, three sections with um, either kind of play like dialogue or some other kind of narrative to it. Um, so I worked all that out in advance. Uh, the album actually ties into one of the books set in the same uh, series. So they go together, although you don't necessarily need to know the album in order to appreciate the book or vice versa. Um, so in the early stages, I usually work up the concept for the album and then I specify the tracks. So I usually give them a temporary title describe the mood. I provide Tony with what I call what we call reference tracks, or basically songs that have the right mood or tone that we're looking for for that particular type of song. And then I usually give him a sense of length, like so that when he starts uh, composing snippets, uh, we have a sense of like how many we need to string together or how, many, how much of the songs can be devoted to lyrics versus just pure instrumentation. So we work through all of that during pre-production and then uh, move into the production phase where basically Tony um, and I have finished arranging everything at that point and we start recording. Um, usually Tony does demos. They're usually um, you know, lo-fi kind of productions where it's just bass and drums in some cases. He might do occasional like melody guitars to give me a flavor of what the melody will sound like so that I can start working up ideas for vocal melodies. Um, and then I fit the lyrics to, um, to the music and we end up hiring musicians. Um, and for music production, the software we're currently using, we're using uh, we're using Final Cut Pro uh, for production. Um, 
Tony has a separate program that we kind of use as a pre-production platform. And then we send those tracks to our recording engineer for integration into the larger project. So then we hire um, you know, musicians and uh, vocalists to come in. Uh, we usually do some pre-production work with them. As I said, we had strings on a couple of songs on the first album. And I worked with the um, string arranger on uh, those sections. And she um, kind of mocked up uh, some sections using an electronic a program, a separate program that simulates strings uh, to give me a sense of what it would sound like. And then I worked with her when she and her partner came in to record. So those sorts of things go on. I think it took us, we spent almost a year doing recording because it's kind of a stop start process. You have to work around everyone else's schedules. Um, so it took quite a while to get all the pieces together. And then I decided to do um, a really elaborate vocal treatment on the last song so this album by the way is available on all the streaming platforms so if you go to spotify or pandora you can find this record um so the band name is project nightscape and um you can find it under that name uh i would recommend you look you want if you want to hear a snippet go to the last song um it's a 10 minute song and i did this really elaborate vocal arrangement at the end it only lasts about two and a half minutes. Um, and you probably won't be able to tell listening to it in a compressed form via a streaming platform, but it has like the vocal part alone has 62 layers to it. Um, it basically meant taking a bunch of vocalists and asking them to, in some cases, do as many as like three octaves of the same uh, same lyric, and then we put it all together in, in post. So, so in any event, production took about a year in terms of recording and doing the initial mix. And then post-production took maybe oh, another three or four months of mixing. Uh, we had, uh, Tony and I tend to write in fairly non-standard tempos. And so we had a, one song in particular that was a really difficult song for the vocalist to um, to work with because it had a really unusual tempo. And so in post, while we were mixing it, we basically not only kind of shifted the uh, lyrics a little bit where they were placed, but we also pitch corrected uh, almost every line because the pitch was also very weird in addition to the tempo so the two combined made it almost impossible for any vocalist to to kind of pull off so there were cases like that where we spent an inordinate amount of time kind of in post um, and we also had a number of guest uh, performers on the first record including the drummer from black sabbath um, a guitarist from a band a lo-fi alternative band called guided by voices and then the bass player from a prog rock band from England called, um, a band's called Marillion. Um, and they did their parts and sent them to us. And then we had to figure out what to do with them in terms of uh, production. In some cases, like in the Tobin Sprout did part of a guitar solo in one song and we used half of that. And then Tony created a bridge between uh, Tobin's part and his part. And so they did a basically a guitar duet. Um, and that was all kind of figured out in post production. Um, and then we did some publicity for it. We had a record release party in Portland and uh, publicized it on social media and that sort of thing for a while. So, in terms of career pathways here, um, it's largely uh, analogous to what I shared with you in terms of film. Um, you have the same sorts of opportunities, I think, in terms of you know volunteering um, for basically being an assistant engineer. 
Um, I know that the engineer that I work with at the map room is open uh, for apprentices. And because Tony and I are still working on the second album, if any of you have an interest in kind of sitting in on a session where we're at, where we're at the map room, uh, just send me an email. I'll provide my contact information shortly. Um, and um, I'll just let you know the next time that we're gonna be in the studio. We are trying to enter another kind of period of recording at the map room, uh, starting with some lead vocals on the first couple of tracks. Um, so if you're interested, again, just feel free to email me. But there are a number of um, kind of uh, recording or production studios in town. Um, and I would just encourage you to reach out to them to see if they're open to uh, allowing you to kind of sit in and kind of learn what they do um, during a, a session or two. Um, and then, of course, you can do your own music if you're a musician or a vocalist. And there are lots of, again, kind of free or relatively inexpensive um, editing programs that you can use and you just start releasing your material on, uh, you know, TikTok or YouTube or your channel of choice. Uh, in terms of post high school pathways, uh, again, they're very similar to what uh, I shared with you in regard to film. So there are trade school programs if you're interested on, in, the, in the engineering side of things. Uh, there are also two-year community college programs and four-year college programs. Um, it's, if you're interested even in a technical field, it's imperative that you understand music composition and you have a sense of music theory. Um, I will say that Tony and I rely on our engineer in some cases on recommendations for what we do for composition or um, um, or arrangement, um, and he can kind of speed the engineering process along uh, based on his understanding of, of music. Um, and without that, we would be uh, a little lost, although Tony is uh, a very accomplished music theorist. So I had a question about work-life balance. Um, so I'm probably not the best person to ask about that, given that I tend to work quite a bit. <laughs> um, however, um, I will say that if you're kind of doing this full time, uh, it's different than if, you know, my case where I have a day job where I have a lot of responsibilities, you know, doing uh, market research based consulting for uh, big companies, largely big companies like Clorox and uh, IBM and a number of others. But, um, and then doing this work kind of as I can uh, versus, you know, making a career of either film or music production. In either case, there's still going to be work life balance issues to be worked out. Um, on the film side, if you're even if you're in a trade and you can find work on a consistent basis, say as a grip or storyboard artist or script supervisor or something like that, um, you have to work from production to production. So sometimes the productions overlap, um, and that leads to uh, some challenges. Uh, other times the productions require you to work in a remote location or switch your schedule. So as I was saying, with this uh, second picture, we worked nights and I basically adopted a, uh, a, a, a vampire's schedule for about five weeks where I was awake uh, all night long and slept basically about four, four and a half hours, usually in the morning from about, uh, you know, 7.30 to 11.30 years or, noon and that was about the, the gist of it. So that was really tiring. So it really just depends on the nature of the, of the production you're involved in, but you're sort of at the mercy of what's available um, and the schedule that the production demands. 
on the music side, I know Tony will tell would tell you that um, he worked full time in the industry in Los Angeles for a while as a member of a band, and he did he helped with the band's uh, production as well. Um, and that was really a full time gig where you're basically working twelve hour days in a lot of cases, especially if you were you, if he was touring. Um, but it's it is very time consuming. Um, and it does present a number of kind of work-life balances, balance issues. Uh, in terms of colleges for music, it's a little different than film, uh, depending on what you want to do. So if you're a musician and you think that you might want to do like engineering, like on the side, but you really want to go to school primarily for say composition, it's a different set of considerations than if you want to go into music production. Um, if you're interested in going into music production for purposes of like film or television, then they would be the same schools as the film schools I, I uh, noted earlier. So I'll wait for you to catch up with questions. In the meantime, I do wanna give you my contact information. Um, as I said, I will, um, I am open to having uh, students attend some of our recording sessions for the new record. And uh, at a later date, I'll probably open up some slots for folks to sit in on some of the editing sessions for the film. Um, we're not far enough along for that. And I imagine we won't be until probably March or April. So, um, and then um, I am in discussions with the chamber about the possibility of resurrecting a film pre-production class, which I taught a couple of years ago. Um, it is designed to be a six week course. It would be two sessions um, every week for six weeks, and it would fulfill your graduation requirement of I think 16 hours. Um, of um, either job shadowing or other similar job experience. And I taught that course in, I taught a course in film pre-production, which covered everything from script development through um, basically production design up until the point of principal photography. Um, and it was designed in part to help students uh, prepare for uh, kind of shooting their own short film after the class was over. Uh, I also taught an, a similar class uh, for comic book production. Um, and I don't think, uh, I don't have any immediate plans to resurrect that, although I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, but I may do that uh, maybe next fall if I end up doing the film production course in the spring. But the chamber will reach out to your teacher and, um, and let you know um, and let you know if um, I, I determine I'm going to offer those courses again. So any other questions? I know we have some, some extra time. Um, so I saw a few uh, questions that kind of got lost in the chat um as we were going through. Um, one of them was, um, are trailers necessary for a movie? Yes, absolutely. Uh, trailers are one of the few things that you can produce to entice people to uh, to see your picture. Um, they're relatively inexpensive to put together. Um, and even if you're an independent uh, production and don't take your trailer through the Motion Picture Association for, you know, the standard uh, you know, standards and practices and that, that sort of thing. It's important to have a trailer online for promotional purposes, um, if not for the purpose of uh, trying to land a distributor. So um, I cut our, the trailer for my first film uh, before I had a distribution deal and my distributor liked the trailer and we just kept it, but it might've been possible that the distributor um, could have asked for another one. 
And as I said, with my newest picture, I'm looking at uh, cutting a trailer together by next fall so that I can take it to the American film market and I'll use it as part of my pitch deck for um, getting uh, a distribution deal uh, for that movie as well. Okay, and then there was another one. Have you ever thought about doing a television series or do you prefer doing movies? Uh, I would certainly be open to doing a television series, especially now with the advent of so many streaming platforms that are willing to do, to fund like a mini series where you're not obligated to do season after season. In the old days, well, when I was growing up, <laughs> a television series meant that you were doing 22 episodes a year. Um, every year your show was renewed. Nowadays, you're not restricted to any you know, show any episode length or number of episodes. So there's a lot more creative freedom. I do think that in a lot of cases, a mini series, like maybe four or five one hour episodes is sort of the ideal format because it allows you to do enough character development for the audience to really get to know and sympathize with your characters. And at the same time, keep the uh, the viewing commitment to a to a minimum you know as a as a viewer you're not obligated to watch a whole season of episodes in order to get the entire story so um so certainly if someone were to offer me the opportunity to do that i would certainly do it uh let's see someone asked about uh oh sitting in on the production of the album uh no level of experience is required for that. If you have an interest, you you know, feel free to send me your contact info and um, we'll hopefully work out um, a, a schedule that works for you in terms of when we're recording in studio. Uh, what type of film conventions you recommend? Um, really, I would focus on maybe some of the more interesting film festivals in Again, ideally in Los Angeles, or there's one in Toronto that's really interesting. Um, but any film festival will give you a sense of kind of what other people are producing. Um, a lot of them are genre related. So they have film festivals dedicated to, you know, anime or science fiction and fantasy or, uh, diff or just pure independent dramas. Uh, so I would just find the festivals that are showing that uh, have the type of programming that appeals to you. Um, and they're a great opportunity again, for you to meet with other people in the industry to make connections in a relatively, uh, you know, low pressure situation. Oftentimes the filmmakers do panels either before or after their picture. Um, and they're typically open to, to meeting with people interested in getting into the industry. Um, volunteering as a production assistant. Um, again, I would, I would recommend you contact the Oregon Film and Video Office um, because they keep track of all the productions in the state. And oftentimes they can provide you, they have contact information for typically that would be the production coordinator um, because those tend to be Netflix funded uh, productions or studio funded productions um, and typically the production coordinator would be the the state's primary contact um, and so they can give you hopefully some contact information so you can reach out to those folks and see if they're open to allowing uh, you to serve as a as a PA and productions have you know different productions have different sort of experience or uh, expertise requirements Oftentimes, they don't have, have any requirements whatsoever. Um, and you may end up, again, just kind of following folks in the grip department, moving, you know, lighting equipment around and that sort of thing. But really, your purpose at that stage is just to uh, get an opportunity to be on set so you can get a sense of what um, shooting a movie is all about or a TV show or whatnot. Any other questions? 
So going back on the trailer, do you, so you actually shoot for a tra trailer purpose because I, I thought it was just part of the movie or something. Oh no, no, it's usually uh, it's usually a it's a marketing tool. Um, and again, usually you end up cutting a trailer together before um, you even have a distributor because you can use that as part of your pitch deck. Some people put together um, kind of pre-production trailers uh, using storyboard or concept art um, as a way to give potential investors a sense of how the movie might look uh, in its final form. Um, what's interesting is if you look at the initial trailer for the second Star Wars movie, The Empire Strikes Back, the first trailer consisted of nothing but a voiceover and concept art. Um, they would never do that today, but I, I suspect they were under pressure to produce a trailer um, at that time. And they, they ultimately just chose to do uh, a very low budget um, kind of pre-production looking uh, trailer. But nowadays, uh, the trailer can make or break a movie, as I'm sure you've had the experience of seeing a trailer and being excited about seeing a film, and then you realize that when you get into the actual watch the movie that they've shown all the best parts in the trailer, or alternately, the trailer looks really cool, and then all the disparate elements that caught your attention in the trailer don't really come together as part of a, a coherent narrative in the uh, in the in the film. Any other questions? Sure, I appreciate everybody, uh, you know, attending the session. And um, again, if you have any follow up questions um, or interest in sitting in on the recording of the album or alternately uh, potentially sitting in on some of the final stages of the uh, of the film. Feel free to send me your contact information, and I'll be in touch uh, when an opportunity arises. Thank you, David. That was a lot of good information, and um, I'm going to stop the recording now.